Finally, in this last subsection on brain one, we're gonna look at the pituitary gland, the major pituitary hormones, what they do, and then uh, some of the most common pituitary disorders that are seen clinically. Now, as discussed in the previous video, uh, we uh, saw that the hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary via that little stalk called the infundibulum, and that the pituitary really has an anterior portion which embryologically arises from something called the Rathke's pouch, which is actually part of the oral mucosa, and then a posterior pituitary, which arises from neuroectoderm. Both are ectodermal tissues, but they come from different places. I think of the anterior related more to your digestive side and metabolism that way, and then the posterior more related to your nerve function. Um, the pituitary, the anterior pituitary, let's start with that one first, is connected again to the uh, uh, hypothalamus via the infundibulum, and it has its own little portal circulatory system. So blood vessels come in uh, around at the base of the hypothalamus here, and there are neurons up in the hypothalamus which project, and they send their hormones down. The hormones are actually made inside the neurons, and they're released, just like neurotransmitters are released at synapses, released into the little portal system, which then circulates down the infundibulum, and then those hormones stimulate the release from cells in the anterior pituitary of the actual hormone um, that the pituitary releases. So we have what's called a hypothalamic releasing hormone released here, and then the actual anterior pituitary hormone is released here. So that's the general kind of structure here of how the anterior pituitary is put together. There are five different types of endocrine cells in the anterior pituitary, and again, depending on if their releasing hormone is released, uh, they will release their hormone. So we have what are called somatotrophs, thyrotrophs, gonadotrophs, lactotrophs, and corticotrophs. Uh, and they secrete what are called tropic and trophic hormones. <clears throat> tropic hormones act directly on target cells to release hormones. So a hypothalamic releasing hormone acting directly on a cell to release its hormone is a tropic effect. Trophic effect is uh, means to directly stimulate growth in tissue. So many of these hormones that are released by the anterior pituitary have trophic effects. So if we um, go down the list and look at the major anterior pituitary hormones, the first one is growth hormone. And that's about 40% of all the anterior anterior pituitary secretion. It's also called somatotrophin, and it's released by somatotrophs. The hypothalamic releasing hormone is growth hormone releasing hormone, very original, or uh, somatocrinin, GHRH. Um, there is an inhibiting hormone, and that's called somatostatin. That's growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So both GHRH, that stimulates the somatotrophs to release growth hormone, GHIH inhibits those cells. And the major effect of the growth hormone is to cause, as implied by its name, growth in tissues. Um, and it works, interestingly, in a convoluted fashion. The growth hormone gets into the blood, and then it causes liver cells to release what are called somatomedins. Uh, and the biggest somatomedin is called IGF-1. So IGF-1 is a peptide, it's a protein. It's released by the liver in response to the growth hormone. And then it's able to actually tell muscle cells, cartilage, and bone to grow. So really, it's the primary growth, the somatomedins are the primary growth uh, supporters. And what they do is they stimulate those cells to increase their protein synthesis uh, and so forth. Um, somatomedins also induce lipolysis, fat loss, and they elevate blood glucose. So in younger life, uh, adequate growth hormone allows for growth that also disinhibits, you know, putting on adipose tissue. It actually is, has a slimming effect. So there's interest in people using growth hormone as adults for that, that role. Uh, we now know that's probably a very bad idea because um, the growth hormone also raises your blood sugar and can cause diabetes as well as high blood pressure in excess. Uh, so growth hormone pretty much is secreted the most in early life and then less as we age. Uh, growth hormone is actually secreted most at night during what's called slow wave sleep. So when you're in a deep sleep rhythm, that releases growth hormone. Uh, exercise, fasting, 
uh, good sleep. These are probably the three primary things that, that can help increase growth hormones. So we really shouldn't be taking growth hormone supplements. Uh, we don't know a much about the effects of different herbs on growth hormone, um, but that's um, um, something that could be interesting to explore. So that's growth hormone. <clears throat> the next um, pituitary hormone is thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. Uh, it's released by cells called thyrotrophs, uh, and its releasing hormone is called TRH, thyroid releasing hormone. Um, somatostatin also inhibits uh, TSH, and TSH gets into the blood and it works directly on the thyroid gland and causes the gland both to increase synthesis of um, thyroid hormones, and the big ones are T4 and T3, and we'll look at those later. I'm going to cover that under the respiratory section because it has such a connection with lung function. Uh, but T3 is the active form. Uh, the gland, however, releases mostly T4. And then in cells, their T4 is converted to T3. So that's the thyroid gland. Um, and I should say that um, with these uh, axes, so if you look at TSH and the thyroid gland, as the thyroid pumps out hormone, there's a negative feedback to the hypothalamus and pituitary, which should downregulate TSH. So that's an example of negative feedback. But we can speak about the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis, HPT axis. The next uh, hormone is uh, ACTH, also known as corticotrophin, and is secreted by corticotrophs. Uh, and its releasing hormone is corticotrophin releasing hormone, CRH. There is no inhibiting hormone that we know of yet. Um, and it acts directly on the adrenal cortex. These are glands that sit on top of your kidneys, which stimulates the release of cortisol, which is known as a glucocorticoid because it raises blood glucose, and androgens, male hormones, and the biggest one is DHEA. And this is present in both males and females. In fact, DHEA is the primary male hormone in females. Um, <clears throat> so that's ACTH, and this has its own axis called the hypothalamus, thalamic pituitary adrenal axis, HPA axis. And uh, that has, like the HPT axis, a circadian 24-hour rhythm. Cortisol is actually, and thyroid, is actually secreted highest in the morning hours. Uh, so cortisol is associated with what's called the cortisol awakening response to get you out of bed. And then it's highest in the morning, and then it drops down as the day goes on. Um, and then it should stay low until about 3, 4 in the morning, and then it starts to peak up again. Uh, that's a normal circadian rhythm on the HPA axis. Unfortunately, some people get things where they actually have cortisol very high at night because of chronic stress, and then they uh, have very low cortisol in the morning, so the curve is kind of flipped, and we call that HPA axis dysregulation. And I bring that up because you might have heard this term adrenal fatigue. Not in the conventional sense. Conventional medicine, when you talk about adrenal fatigue, they mean your adrenal glands are usually destroyed due to an autoimmune process, and they no longer put out cortisol. But with chronic stress, we can get adrenal uh, HPA axis dysregulation, where you don't secrete cortisol at the right times, uh, even though your adrenal gland still puts out cortisol. And that's what a lot of people refer to as so-called adrenal fatigue, which is not really the right term. So it really should be HPA axis dysregulation. Um, in Chinese medicine, we'll see that the um, uh, triple burner process as well as the gallbladder process tie in very highly with the HPA axis. Um, the next hormone is prolactin and it's secreted by uh, lactotrophs. Um, we don't know of a stimulating hormone, a releasing hormone, although TSTRH suppresses, um, but it's not a primary inhibitory hormone. Uh, we do know that dopamine inhibits. So uh, dopamine is the primary inhibitory uh, hormone on prolactin. We don't really think there's, we don't know of a stimulating or releasing hormone. And uh, the main effect of prolactin is to work on the mammary glands in the breast to stimulate milk production. Um, it also suppresses the next set of hormones we'll talk about, the gonadotropins, which are regulating your reproductive function. It suppresses them, and that could inhibit sexual function, also cause... Uh, anovulation, lack of ovulation, and amenorrhea, lack of menses in females. Um, we'll talk about prolactin here in the next slide because one of the primary pathologies of the pituitary are tumors. These are not cancerous, they're benign tumors, but they uh, involve a single type of pituitary cell overgrowing and over-secreting its hormone. 
And the most common type of pituitary tumor is a prolactinoma. It oversecretes prolactin, so a person would see increased milk production, um, usually bilaterally, but from both nipples. Uh, when there's you know no pregnancy, there's no breastfeeding going on, something like that. Um, so we'll we'll talk about the signs and symptoms of that. Uh, finally, we have um, our two gonadotropins, and that is FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, uh, and LH, luteinizing hormone. Hormone both are secreted by gonadotrophs in response to this hypothalamic hormone, GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Um, GNR, GnRH is released in different pulsatile rhythms. So if you look at a female menstrual cycle, the first roughly two weeks from menses to ovulation, um, the GnRH is released in very slow pulses, and this causes the gonadotropes to release FSH. And what FSH does is it really uh, triggers the production of estrogen. It supports the uterine lining to grow in the first half of the menstrual cycle. And then in males, it works in the testes uh, it causes cells there to release estrogen, and that is involved in sperm development. LH is released in females in the second half of the menstrual cycle, and its function is, number one, to trigger ovulation. There's a surge of LH that triggers ovulation, and then it stimulates the development of what's called the corpus luteum. So after the egg ovulates from the ovary, what the remains of the follicle that was there becomes the corpus luteum, and that secretes progesterone and that stimulates uh, 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 development of the uterus to prepare it for implantation for pregnancy. In males, LH stimulates testosterone production. So in females, it stimulates progesterone and uterine um, patency, and then the uh, male's testosterone. So that's LH and FSH. Those are your what are called gonadotrophins. And then there is another hormone which we don't talk about too much in endocrinology, and that is MSH melanocyte stimulating hormone. This is also released by corticotropes when they make the uh, cortisol, when they make the ACTH. Uh, the cortical releasing hormone is the releasing hormone. Dopamine is the inhibiting hormone. And this one we don't think has much of a role in humans, although that's still not worked out. But we do know that this is involved in skin darkening. And um, we do know in animals it's important for coat coloring and so forth. Um, so those are the primary anterior pituitary hormones and their different functions. The posterior pituitary is a lot simpler, fortunately. Um, so here the neurons up in the hypothalamus directly project down to the infundibulum and they synapse onto the little portal system and they release their hormones right into the blood. So there are no uh, cell groups in the posterior pituitary that release their own hormones. Um, and then those hormones get into the blood. And the two main hormones here are oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin. So let's look at what these two. So oxytocin, or OT, um, this is secreted into the blood. And its main um, stimulus is uh, uh, really going to be uterine distension or stimulation of the nipples. Um, and it's going to work by triggering uterine contraction. So right before delivery, this is the hormone that caused the uterus to contract and the cervix to dilate more. And there is actually a synthetic form of this known as pentosin, which can be um, injected uh, to kind of, kind of help speed delivery along. Uh, it's also involved in what's called the milk letdown reflex. So prolactin makes the milk, but the oxytocin helps to release it. Uh, there's many other roles, and I should say this with prolactin too. We think there's dozens of other roles now for prolactin, like regulating uh, uh, fat metabolism as well as sugar metabolism and so forth. Uh, so we might be hearing more and more of that in the decades to come. But with oxytocin, um, this one is sometimes associated with or called the love hormone in the sense that when you feel this euphoric rush in love, um, kind of the Hollywood type love or I'm falling in love, this sort of thing, that is uh, thought to be mediated by oxytocin. And there are oxytocin receptors throughout the brain. But interestingly, there are oxytocin receptors on the heart and on the um, area around the heart, the pericardium. So very curiously, oxytocin has this connection with the heart and the pericardium. This is sort of the love connection in Chinese medicine. Also, the filtering of those love impulses, if we do that incorrectly, that can result in pericardial imbalances in the Chinese medicine terminology. In fact, the people that have pericardium disturbance uh, we think often, you know, we find individuals who maybe are seeking one relationship after another, 
living off of that thrill of the relationship and the love interest. And as soon as that fades, then they give up that relationship and move on. Uh, and that sort of correlates with oxytocin secretion. Uh, chocolate and things like that also tend to release oxytocin. So there's uh, maybe another reason why some people crave chocolate. The other posterior pituitary hormone is ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Uh, it's also known as arginine vasopressin or just vasopressin. And uh, it is secreted um, uh, in response to elevated blood osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is determined by the amount of uh, electrolytes dissolved in the blood, in particular sodium. So as sodium levels go up, that tells the brain we need to dilute out the sodium. We need to hold on to water and not urinate it out uh, to dilute the sodium to keep it within a certain range. So antidiuretic hormone is gonna work on the kidneys to actually prevent loss of water or antidiuresis. Um, dehydration, uh, loss of blood volume, pain and stress all also release ADH. And then having low blood osmotic pressure, uh, high blood volume, or alcohol, as well as caffeine, all disinhibit. And that's why with alcohol, you have a couple of drinks and then you're just urinating every few minutes. Uh, and that's because alcohol disinhibits antidiuretic hormone. Same thing with uh, caffeine. Um, and the target for ADH is the kidneys, although it also works on sweat glands and the arterioles. And really it's gonna work by conserving the uh, body's water. So it essentially tells the kidney, stop diuresing. It also causes blood vessels to vasoconstrict a little bit and causes a decrease of water loss through perspiration. So um, all different strategies to keep one's fluid volume. So those are the two uh, posterior pituitary hormones. And I'm not gonna talk much, we don't talk much about oxytocin disorders. There are a number of um, antidiuretic hormone disorders. I mentioned diabetes insipidus earlier. That's when you don't secrete antidiuretic hormone. And so you end up just urinating uh, constantly. Uh, so no matter how much you drink, you're just having to go to the bathroom and urinate every sometimes 10, 15 minutes. And it can be copious amounts of water as well. And as you can imagine, that can result in severe dehydration. So that's called diabetes insipidus, and that's different than the typical diabetes or diabetes mellitus, which involves dysregulation of blood glucose. This one has nothing to do with blood glucose. Um, and then there's something called syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, SIADH, where we get too much ADH secreted, and that commonly happens after things like brain surgery or head trauma, things like that. And then you hold on to too much water and you dilute out all your sodium and you get what's called hyponatremia. And I mentioned a few lectures, a couple lectures ago that hyponatremia is a problem um, when it's overcorrected too quickly with, let's say, giving intravenous sodium, that can lead to demyelination of those motor neurons in the pons. And that can lead to that central pontine myelin myelinolysis. So um, those are two disorders with antidiuretic hormone. Diabetes insipidus, not enough antidiuretic hormone. Uh, SIADH, uh, too much antidiuretic hormone. So let me just summarize some of the common pituitary disorders, because this is really the only place we're going to see this um, throughout the, the terms. Um, I should say a couple of things. First, diseases of the anterior pituitary are more common and typically produce more symptoms than of the posterior pituitary. Uh, and generally, the pituitary diseases can cause hyperfunction or hypofunction of specific cells, uh, most typically hyperfunction, and that would cause hyperpituitarism uh, versus hypopituitarism would be hypofunction. Um, and if you look to the right here, hypopituitarism is relatively rare. Um, it's the results of, it can be deficiency, result in deficiencies of all the hormones or just one, but typically if it happens, it's going to be all the hormones and that causes what's called pan hypopituitarism. So all of the anterior pituitary hormones are lost. So decreased growth hormone, this would be a single, uh, deficiency of a single anterior pituitary hormone causes what's called pituitary dwarfism. Um, when people see people really short stature, that's usually not due to loss of growth hormone. Pituitary dwarfism is very, very uncommon. Um, most people with short stature have what are called a, uh, an achondroplasia. That's a bone uh, growth defect. Uh, but this is one form of, of dwarfism. Um, and if we have a deficiency of the posterior pituitary, I mentioned diabetes insipidus already with ADH. So those would be example of isolated deficiencies. But again, most of them would be pan-hypopituitarism. 
Um, so a pituitary adenoma, a tumor, could obliterate the whole pituitary and you loss of hormones. Another type of tumor, which is more common in children, is a cranial pharyngioma, and that starts up in the hypothalamus. Um, in the, you can have what's called pituitary apoplexy, which is a loss of blood flow to the pituitary, and then essentially it's like a little mini stroke uh, in the pituitary, and so it loses those cells that secrete these hormones. Uh, a sort of a version of that is called Sheehan syndrome, <clears throat> and in Sheehan's, this happens after pregnancy, after birth, giving birth, um, where during pregnancy, the pituitary has to actually enlarge significantly to maintain all the levels of the maternal hormones that are needed for that pregnancy. But the pituitary doesn't get a really good blood supply. So it's always a little bit ischemic. It has a little bit of less blood than it needs. Um, at birth, if there is a sudden loss, a hemorrhage, a major hemorrhage and loss of blood with that delivery, this can cause the blood flow to essentially stop to the pituitary and many of those cell types that secrete those hormones die. And so this affects usually the anterior, not the posterior pituitary hormones. And um, this can result in panhypopituitarism. So that would mean that from that point on, a woman might be hypothyroid she might have true adrenal insufficiency. We call that Addison's disease um, because she's not putting out the ACTH. Um, she won't regain her sexual function because her gonadotropins won't be there. She won't be able to breastfeed because there's no prolactin. So that Sheehan syndrome had pretty significant effects. Fortunately, there's different degrees of this. In many women, it happens mildly and then it's transient and it, those cells eventually regrow. In others, it's permanent. And so a woman would have to take individual hormones to replace all those functions. Uh, something called empty cella can also happen where the pituitary essentially shrinks, and that's sometimes due to apoplexy or Sheehan's uh, trauma to head trauma or different diseases like amyloidosis or hemochromatosis where you deposit too much iron. All these could cause hypopituitarism. More commonly, though, is hyperpituitarism, and it usually affects only a single cell type. So only a single anterior pituitary hormone is going to be oversecreted. So if there's oversecretion of growth hormone, that would be pituitary gigantism. If it happens in a child or adolescent before the epiphyseal plates, those are little cartilage plates in the bone that separate the shaft of the bone from the head of the bone. And that's where the bone elongates from. And those usually close by the time you stop growing, which is around 16 to 19 for most kids. Um, so if the growth hormone is secreted before the epiphyseal plate ossifies, calcifies over, um, we get pituitary gigantism. And that individual is going to be very large, very tall stature, very large hands and feet and so forth. <clears throat> and some cases have been way in the seven feet, eight foot range, actually. Um, and then acromegaly would happen if the pituit if the tumor happened, you oversecreted growth hormone after the epiphyseal plates closed. And then you don't actually grow taller usually, but you get really big. Their bones that continue to grow are your jawbone and your hands and feet. So you get really big hands and feet, a big jaw, uh, but you don't necessarily grow in height after that. So that's acromegaly. If there is an overproduction of ACTH, uh, that would be Cushing disease. And um, we'll look at Cushing's disease and Cushing syndrome. We'll differentiate that later, but that is overproduction of cortisol. And then overproduction of prolactin would be a, a hyperprolactinemia. <clears throat> and so um, that's going to be another uh, type of hormone deficit, uh, excess there. If it happened in the posterior pituitary, again, increased ADH would give us the SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate uh, uh, antidiuretic hormone. Uh, the causes, the most common cause of anterior pituitary hypersecretion will be pituitary adenomas. And we'll look at those here next because they are pretty common and I do see these in the clinic fairly regularly and they need the appropriate treatment. Um, increased ADH can come from trauma, uh, head surgery, kidney disease, and so forth. A little less common than pituitary adenomas. So if you look at the most common disorders, pituitary adenomas, and of them, prolactinomas. So Adenomas can secrete any of the hormones, anterior pituitary, but most common is, is the um, prolactinomas. Uh, central diabetes insipidus, <coughs> overproduction, I'm sorry, underproduction of ADH, and then syndrome of inappropriate ADH, SIADH. Uh, 
And then I mentioned the tumors, craniopharyngiomas, that happen uh, are caught most commonly in children um, that can also cause a deficiency of the pituitary hormones. So these are the four most common pituitary disorders. So let me just say a few words here on pituitary adenomas. They account for about 10% of all intracranial cancers, uh, neoplasms. These are benign tumors, and the difference here between a benign and a malignant tumor is they do not metastasize. It won't, these cells won't break off and spread to other parts of the body and set up a tumor, um, but they can exert local effects by causing oversecretion of the tumor, or if they get big enough, they can compress the stalk of the pituitary, and that can block all of those uh, hypothalamic hormones from coming down. And it can also invade local structures. This area is very close to the optic chiasm, where the optic nerve crosses, and that can affect the vision. It's also very close to uh, some of those ocular motor cranial nerves, cranial nerve three, four, and six. And so that can block those activities. So people can get visual changes. They can get have difficulty with vision and moving the eyes uh, and central headaches above their eyes and so forth. Uh, the peak incidence for pituitary adenomas is midlife between 30 and 60 and they often remain undiagnosed uh, for most for a lot of the population for the prevalence we think is about 17 percent in the general population but the number of people diagnosed with this are typically much lower uh, most are isolated solitary lesions and they usually don't have um, uh, associated symptoms uh, but they can produce symptoms again via the stalk effect or mass effect stalk effect is when the infundibulum is compressed um, and that has a weird phenomena where actually it causes an over secretion of prolactin because you get a loss of dopamine coming down from the hypothalamus um, and then a mass effect where it basically spreads and invades the structures around the pituitary um, about 10 percent are asymptomatic and we call those uh, incidentalomas they sometimes people go in for imaging like a head CT or MRI and they'll detect a pituitary adenoma but there's no symptoms with it and if you level measure the level of hormones of all these different hormones they're all in the normal range so we call those incidentalomas about three percent associated with what's called multiple endocrine neoplasia men type one I'm not going to get into that here that's a, a inherited condition and then um, again usually most pituitary adenomas uh, involve a single cell type that secretes a single hormone. So in this case, if we look at prolactin, lactotrophs over secrete prolactin. Now, depending on their size, they can be either microadenomas, so less than a centimeter in diameter. These are typically easier to treat and they don't have enlargement into the cella turcica. That's the little bony saddle that the pituitary sits in. And so they're not going to cause as many secondary symptoms like on the optic nerve or something like that. Um, macroadenomas are greater than a centimeter and they're going to be uh, more associated with mass effects, um, visual changes, uh, blockage of cerebral spinal fluid, so maybe hydrocephalus, uh, intense headaches, things like that. These are more difficult to treat. So if you look at the adenomas, the most common type is prolactinoma, as I said. The next type would be a growth hormone adenoma, causing either pituitary gigantism or acromegaly. And then ACTH adenoma causing Cushing's uh, disease, over secretion of cortisol. And then ones that over secrete TSH or the gonadotropins are very, very unusual. So we don't see too many of those. Um, to work this up, we usually get a very complete history and physical exam. And we might look for signs and symptoms of elevated, in, if we look at prolactin, for example, elevated nipple discharge, things like that. We're, of course, going to gather all the labs like measure prolactin, uh, the IGFs, which remember are the growth hormone metabolites from the liver, uh, sex hormones, uh, uh, thyroid testing, and then cortisol testing. And then we would typically do brain MRI imaging with contrast. And the contrast agent is gadolinium. And this allows one to see tumors down to about two millimeters in size. So pretty specific. Uh, so that's the typical assessment. The treatment depends on what kind of hormone is being over-secreted. With um, prolactinomas, the medical treatment would be what are called dopamine agonists. These are drugs that mimic dopamine. So bromocryptine, carbegaline are the two big examples of that. And these are often given for a year, year and a half. And then a person is gradually tapered off of them to see if maybe it, the tumor stops secreting the hormone. Uh, but most of those cases will continue to secrete hormone. 
and um, they will eventually need um, surgery. So not all cases do, but the ones where it continues to secrete will need surgery. And there's two ways to do surgery. One is to go up through the nose, drill through the sphenoid bone, and then they have access to the pituitary, and through microsurgery can go in there and actually resect out. It's incredible the uh, it's precision that can be done to sect out the tumor without damaging any of the surrounding cranial nerves or any other surrounding uh, very delicate structures. Um, so that is called the transphenoidal microsurgery approach. Uh, more drastic, and this is more common for the macroadenomas, would be to have to, you have to take the whole front of the skull off and then lift up the frontal part of the brain and then go in underneath that. Uh, and those surgeries usually are just aimed usually at trying to debulk the tumor if it's gotten really big to see then if medical therapies might be able to shrink it further. Um, there are somatostatin analogs for the growth hormone oversecretion, and then a lot of times one needs to have hormonal replacement therapy to, um, in the case of prolactin, that will actually suppress, remember, your estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, so those hormones might need to be replaced. Okay, so that's just a quick overview of pituitary disorders, and uh, we're going to be looking at the downstream glands, thyroid, adrenals, the sex glands, as we go throughout the terms, uh, but just understand how the hypothalamus and pituitary work to regulate all these different glands. So that wraps it up for the BioBrain1 module.